What happens when guitar manufacturers Martin and Gibson square off in a guitar battle royale? Well, Acoustic Tuesday happens, and I'm glad you're here because today, Martin and Gibson are gonna square off in a heavyweight matchup for the ages in seven rounds of guitar geeky goodness. Yes, indeed, seven rounds of fighting between Martin and Gibson, two of the leading US guitar manufacturers, and I am pumped to dig right in, so let's go ahead and do that. While we can't do all seven categories at once, we have to start somewhere, so let's start at the first category, and that is history. Now, this category is tightly contested, because on one hand, you've got Martin, an incredibly well-documented company. I mean, from its start, from its inception, they've kept archive after archive. On the other hand, you've got Gibson, and their record keeping is questionable at best, but their history is loaded with mythology and lore. So who wins? Well, let's Let's dig in just a little bit deeper. Let's check in with a local Michigan musician who used to work for the Gibson factory, and he gives us a little insight into the type of person Orville Gibson was, the founder of Gibson Musical Instruments. Orville Gibson, a funny guy, and a lot of people have no clue about how he ever got to Kalamazoo, because uh, he was born in northern New York State. But he ended up coming to Kalamazoo and working at a shoe store, and he was kind of an eccentric, funny guy. Um, my guess is he was one of those characters that you, you kind of find around uh, town today, and you find them very interesting, and just uh, they wear some different kind of clothes and they act differently. Well, I think those people are the visionaries and Orville was definitely one of those. And to take the idea of uh, the Stradivarius uh, violin and apply some of those same principles to a musical instrument, that's what Orville was thinking about in uh, those early years, 1880s and 1890s. Yes, Orville Gibson is an interesting cat to say the least. Let me give you a little bit of the scoop on Gibson's story. So Gibson was started by Orville Gibson. First documented instrument was built in 1894. Uh, they incorporated in 1902 in Kalamazoo, Michigan. They acquired Epiphone in 1957 and in 1984 moved from Kalamazoo to Nashville. In 1987, Gibson Acoustic set up shop in Bozeman, Montana after acquiring Flatiron Mandolin Company. So a pretty interesting history and uh, certainly a lot of bouncing around. Now let's focus on Martin's history. As I mentioned before, it's incredibly well documented and Nazareth, Pennsylvania has been for most in part the home of Martin Guitars with a brief stop at the Hudson Street location in New York upon C.F. Martin Sr.'s initial uh, crossing of the ocean here to the U.S. Now, one of the things that stuns me about Martin Guitars is their accurate and almost incessant record keeping. And their archives absolutely fascinate me, especially as a guitar geek. I think you'll agree that Martin Guitar's archives are incredible. So let's kind of get the scoop on how these archives came to be. One of the best aspects of this building is the attic. Actually, three different attics, one above each of the various sections of the building. This is the original attic over the 1859 section of the building. And the Martin family saved everything. In this attic, we found the, all the old documents and letters that now make up our archives, together with the tools and patterns and coffin cases, making this one of the finest archives in the United States. Pretty stunning stuff. Right before we went to that clip, I was gonna introduce Dick Boak, and I took a breath to introduce his name, and I totally, his name escaped my brain. Uh, so that was Dick Boak, uh, one of the lead archivists at Martin Guitars, I should say. He says he's since retired, but he is large in part uh, one of the reasons we have such extensive research done in the archives. Both him, Dick Boak, and Mike Longworth have done such a great job in compiling these archives. Now, to get an actual firsthand look of some of the actual archives, I found another clip that does this wonderful pan of some of the things that are contained in the archives. I'm talking sales order slips, uh, material purchase receipts, uh, letters from artists, you name it, it's all there. Let's have a look. <laughs> 
company has a long history with more than 181 years of photos, correspondence, financial records, invoices, ledgers, and more. Together, these pieces of ephemera tell a story of a remarkable company that is an iconic American brand name and played a crucial role in the development of music in America. This valuable resource sheds light on Martin family history, the way the American flat top acoustic guitar was created, and offers insights into the day-to-day -day history of one of the world's oldest family-owned companies. The Martin archives have been a work in progress for much of the past five decades. The first person to put serious time and effort into creating the archives was Martin employee and researcher Mike Longworth. So here we are. We've got Gibson on one hand, who's got an interesting story in, in and of themselves, uh, kind of a, a bouncing around and whatnot. And then we've got Martin, essentially staying in one place, keeping track of every little minute detail that happened on the day to day. So who wins the history category? Well, you might think it's obvious. You might think, okay, well, clearly Martin, because they have such well-documented history. But let's take into account the mythology and lore. On one hand, Gibson is just loaded with mythology, lore, all of these wonderful stories that kind of really paint a colorful picture of the acoustic guitar's history in America. And on the other hand, you've got this wonderfully well-documented company, Martin Guitars. So who wins? I have to draw a tie at the end of this category. Yes, at the end of this category, we've got Martin at one point and Gibson at one point. I couldn't decide on a clear winner because I think they both are very important in terms of the history of the guitar in the United States of America. So, do you agree with me? This is where in the comments you say, Tone, I don't agree with you and here's why. Or you say, hey Tone, I, I do agree with you. I think this is a, a very worthy tie. Let me know what you think about the winner or lack of winner in this category in the comments below. And uh, let's go ahead and dig into the rest of these categories. This week on Acoustic Tuesday, we've started the battle of Martin versus Gibson and we simply cannot stop now. Coming up are six more rounds of battle between Martin and Gibson, and the categories will be as follows. Sustainability, manufacturing, model offering, innovation, custom shop, and artist roster. Guitars were made here between 1859 and 1964 when the new factory at Sycamore Street was built. But this uh, building certainly contains a tremendous amount of history. Welcome to Acoustic Tuesday, episode number 148. This is the show where you're going to learn about acoustic guitar gear, discover acoustic artists, and get inspired to live your very best acoustic life. As with all episodes of Acoustic Tuesday, I'm going to share with you my guitar geek list for the week. And yes, this week indeed finds us looking at Martin versus Gibson, trying to declare a clear winner. And by the end of today's episode, we will indeed have a clear winner. In fact, I wanted to dig right into these categories, so we're gonna forego our normal tradition of Guitar Geek trivia in an effort to pack as much into this episode as we possibly can. So let's dig into the next category, and that is sustainability. Now, upon uh, entering this research phase of the episode, before doing any research, I should say, I should correct myself, I thought to myself, well, Martin clearly runs away with this category. Uh, no doubt about it. They've made tons of effort in the sustainability category. But I thought, you know what? I need to do my, my fair share of research. I need to give each company a fair shake. So I dug in and I thought to myself, I'm going to start with Gibson because I was, to be honest, skeptical. And I was very happy with what I found because Gibson has, uh, I believe this was in 2019, they released an entire line of sustainable instruments featuring domestic hardwoods for the back and sides, all wood appointments, and really generally a very classy instrument line that really celebrates sustainable manufacturing processes. processes. And I thought the finish was the most uh, interesting thing about these guitars. To learn more about it, I'm going to kick it over to Carl Kamen from Chicago Music Exchange and Bozeman Local and Gibson Acoustic Rep Don Raffato. Here they are. For the first time, we are building guitars without nitro lacquer. We're doing a small run of three instruments called the Sustainable Series. Traditional looks, you have your L00, your J45, and your Hummingbird, but we decided to try to make them as friendly to the universe as possible. No nitro lacquer, many wood appointments, the inlays are wood, the Gibson logo is wood, the pickguards are wood, has a beeswax 
hand rubbed finish to protect the surface but just allow it to vibrate to be free the weight is incredible the tonality is just wonderful uh, the beeswax can be reapplied as needed as, as wear happens and we're just so excited about these something totally new and different for Gibson Acoustic So I applaud Gibson for that sustainable effort. I think it's a, a great way to make a great, uh, a beautiful instrument uh, from their iconic lineup and really kind of tip the hat and give a nod to sustainability. Plus it's a cool guitar geek, small world moment because Carl from uh, Chicago Music Exchange actually sold me my 56 Martin single 018 when I was visiting Chicago. And Don, I've known for quite a long time, ever since I worked at Music Villa, he was the Gibson acoustic rep. He'd be coming in all the time and he's the one that you see in a lot of Gibson acoustic videos. So a very cool moment nonetheless. So we've shifted our focus uh, to Gibson and thought, wow, you know, they are making some movement in the sustainability category. I would like to now direct our focus to Martin. What are they doing in the sustainable world? Well, I think in the early 2000s, I think right around 2003, maybe even 2002, they started doing the Smartwood series, which uh, again, featured domestic hardwoods, actually featured one of my favorite Martin models, the SWOM GT, the Smartwood OM with a gloss top, a solid cherry back and sides, reclaimed spruce top, and some beautiful faux tortoise shell appointments on that guitar. Really one of my favorite Martin models, even aside from the sustainability piece. So I thought, cool, Martin's got the sustainable models, that's neat, but what more are they doing? So upon doing some research, I found that Martin Guitars recently became a B Corporation. And I was like, well, what the hell is a B Corporation, first of all? Well, it's kind of an elite small group of manufacturers who adhere to a very, uh, kind of a tight list of principles, both from uh, quality of employee life uh, and, and environment at the facility, and also what sustainable efforts they're making. I'm oversimplifying the B Corporation here, but nonetheless, it ties into sustainability in a big way. And here's a video kind of explaining how Martin actually achieved this B Corporation status. That surprised me about Martin was I knew it was a great American company and I assumed that a company that's been around that long and been a family business for that long probably cared about its people. What surprised me was the depth of the environmental commitment from the chiller plant uh, to the sawdust recapture and to the cogen plant. There were, there were a ton of different things that were going on uh, with the environmental practices and that was really impressive and surprising for me, like a, a huge pleasant surprise. So here we are learning more about Martin as a company and some of the efforts they're making on the manufacturing end to make an impact on that sustainable area. You know, sustainable harvesting of woods, sustainable manufacturing processes, because as we all know, the wood that's used in guitar making is indeed a limited resource and we should have that consciousness around it as we use it to make guitars, especially as a, as a kind of a mass manufacturer of guitars. Both Martin and Gibson make tons of guitars day in and day out, so it's nice to know that these manufacturers are taking that into account as they're making guitars. That being said, who wins this category? Well, in my opinion, I applaud Gibson for their efforts in the sustainability sector, and in fact, encourage them to, to continue down that road. However, I think Martin has kind of led the way, both in model offering in the sustainability world, as well as manufacturing processes. So I think Martin wins this category, the sustainability category, which puts our score currently at Martin two points and Gibson one point. Let's go ahead and move on to the next category, which is manufacturing. Now you might be thinking, whoa, we just talked about manufacturing. You know, uh, we talked about sustainability and manufacturing, all that stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take a different perspective on manufacturing uh, proper here. I'm talking about raw lumber coming in one end of the factory and a guitar coming out the other side of the factory. And I think both companies I should say this, I've had a chance to actually visit and enter the factories of both companies. I've had a chance to go on tours of the factory of both companies, and I am very impressed. And I will say the companies are very different in how they manufacture and how the factories actually look. So just so you get a sense of kind of the, uh, the way things are within each factory, let's start out with Gibson. 
Now, Gibson started in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, in the 80s actually moved to Bozeman. And I find this really interesting because they're here right where Acoustic Life Studios is. And when I worked for Music Villa, I had a chance to actually tour the factories. And just so we're all on the same page, I found a video that gives us some behind the scenes of the Gibson Acoustic Factory here in Bozeman, and here it is. Two things I have to point out there that um, really aren't related to manufacturing, but again, small guitar geek moment, small world a guitar geek moment. Uh, the first fellow that you saw doing inlay on the fingerboards, uh, his name's Joe, and I actually used to work with him at Weber Mandolins. He did all the inlay at Weber Mandolins and now works at Gibson Musical Instruments here in Bozeman, Montana. And then also I noticed somebody wearing a Patrick Kane shirt, uh, one of my favorite Chicago Blackhawks. So. A huge tip of the hat to that individual for, you know, having his heart in the right place when it comes to hockey. So that's, that's behind the scenes at the Gibson uh, factory here in Bozeman, Montana, where all of the Gibson acoustic instruments are made. Now I'd like to hop in our, um, our, our little uh, super travel machine and visit Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Again, had a chance to go to this factory, experience a tour and get the behind the scenes look. But again, so we're all on the same page, let's go ahead and look behind the scenes, beh take a peek behind the curtain at the Martin Guitar Manufacturing Facility. There are hundreds of steps involved in making one Martin guitar. You want to make these parts as precisely as possible, but once you've got those parts and pieces, it's the human hand that does a fantastic job of putting them together. And we're really proud of it. You to see how a Martin guitar is made. Here in our Nazareth factory, we have about 500 employees. There's a very specific formula that goes into building one of our guitars. The woods have to be a certain thickness. The braces have to be a certain thickness. Can't have the woods too thick or you're not gonna get the sound you want out of it. We try to build the guitar to a point where it's almost so thin that it might implode on itself. The wood is an integral part of not only the aesthetics, but the sound. Guitar builders, through a trial and error, discovered that exotic tropical hardwoods work really well if you want to make a really good sounding guitar that's beautiful and durable. Right here we have a guitar where the body is made out of sinker mahogany. This wood has been immersed in streams in Belize for could be hundreds of years. People can be skeptical. Are they still handmade? And then you get about halfway through the tour, people kind of go, yeah, they're still handmade and now I understand why they're so expensive. It's a challenge, it's complicated, and it takes time. One of the amazing things about the Martin factory is that it has grown essentially in the same place that it's always been uh, since I wanna say like 1850 or somewhere in there. And when you go to Martin, you can actually see the old homestead with the old, old factory where the machines were actually steam powered. And then as you tour and kind of walk through these various rooms, you can see the conversion to actual electricity. And then uh, when you go to the new plant, uh, it's pretty amazing the, the technology used there. And as I mentioned before, I've had a chance to go to both of these factories. And I think they both do a fantastic job of taking raw lumber and out of the other end comes magnificent and iconic acoustic guitars. So to me, this category actually comes down to you, the guitar geek. How accessible are each of these manufacturing facilities? Well, I have a personal story for each. Number one, I went to Nazareth, Pennsylvania and I wanna say about 2015 and got treated to a beautiful tour of the Martin Guitar Factory. And I went to the Resaw area, I went to the custom shop and every place in between, it was beautiful and uh, I really enjoyed my time there. I felt well taken care of and I felt like they really, each and every luthier was passionate about their job in the whole process. Now I have uh, another story about Gibson. 
uh, when I worked for Music Villa, and this was probably a year prior, in 2014, um, I also had a chance to tour the Gibson Acoustic Factory. And I thought to myself, man, this is so cool because as a dealer, I got to go behind the scenes and again, go to the resaw area, go to the inlay area, go to the custom shop, the whole deal. And I thought, I, I just felt so grateful to be able to do that. But one of the things that I need to mention is that I was able to do that as a dealer or part of a dealer group. Whereas I believe the current uh, status is as just a guitar geek wandering up to the Gibson factory, you can't necessarily get a tour. And I don't believe, to the best of my knowledge, I don't even think you can schedule a tour. I don't think they make public tours available. So when it comes down to accessibility, I think Martin certainly wins in this category. So in the manufacturing category, I crown Martin the winner, which puts our score at Martin three points and Gibson one point. Yes, Martin is certainly pulling away here. And I do hope that Gibson has what it takes to pull ahead or at least pull close to Martin at this point. But we're gonna send the fighters to their corners right now. They need a break. They've been going at it for quite some time. And I wanna ask you, how are we doing? How are we doing? I wanna check in with you and I want you to chime in on these categories. How do we do in the sustainability and the manufacturing? Do you have a differing opinion? Do you agree? Either way, let me know in the comments below. I would love to spur on some discussion about your take on Martin versus Gibson. And while you're doing that, I, uh, speaking of comments, I actually wanna hop in our time machine, go back to episode number 146. For those of you who haven't seen it, let me just give you a little input here. That was the Molly Tuttle episode. Yeah, the Molly Tuttle episode, the Molly Tuttle episode. We're gonna look at some comments from that particular episode. Our first one comes from Robert Martin. And he simply says this, a simple observation. He says, I love how goalie Tony nods his head whenever big Tony gets emphatic about a topic and starts bopping his arms on this desk. And uh, yes, this is little goalie Tony. I wanna thank uh, Dom and Sharon for sending me the goalie Tony, uh, Acoustic Tuesday viewers, and of course, part of the TAC family. And also, I should, I should also call attention to this fine Stanley Cup uh, made by TAC member, TAC family member Julie I, also Acoustic Tuesday viewer. Uh, so huge thanks to the uh, to the folks that watch the show that send in some well some darn cool things. Uh, yeah, this this Stanley Cup makes me feel makes me feel proud every time I sit down at this desk. Our next comment comes from David Hale, and he says this: After hearing the comments about flight cases, everyone has their own views and opinions that need to be heard. That's how we grow. It's called diversity. For a fun challenge, let's find out what everyone's dream guitar is. For me, it's a D28, and it's coming in the near future. Great show, and always keep your geek on. I think this is a fitting request from David. Uh, so if you do have a dream guitar, you can leave it in the comments below. In fact, I've got uh, some wonderful news developments. I, I don't know if I can really share them right now on today's episode, but I have just entered the process of specking out my dream guitar. The, the, the guitar that has been on the top shelf of my mind for quite some time, it's happening. And it's going to be documented. And I'm going to share each of the steps with you here on the show. I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet, we'll reveal it later, uh, but it's certainly going to be a fun process to follow. I am like, a kid waiting for his birthday. That's how excited I am. Now it is gonna take some time, I will say that. So, uh, but I'll make sure to keep you all tuned into that process. But as David suggested, if you have a dream guitar, put it in the comments below. I think it'd be cool to see what people think of their, uh, their own dream guitar and, and each other's really. Our next comment comes from Grant Niels. And he says this, hey Tony, great show as usual. I just wanted to comment on your not worthy comment. Years ago, I was given a March Martin HD28 from my boss of many years for all my hard work. I could not play well and never felt worthy of playing it and afraid of damaging it. I could break a sledgehammer. <laughs> so it sat in its case not being played. When my mother died and left me some money, I bought a much cheaper carbon fiber Martin, which I played uh, much more often. But no one told me the more you played a guitar, the better, the better it would sound. So all those years, I could have been improving not only my playing, but also the sound of my guitar were wasted. Now the tone right sits on the guitar for weeks, trying to make up for lost time. I think what I'm trying to say is that perhaps neither the guitar or the guitarists are worthy in the beginning. And only through time spent playing together do each earn their worth. Whoa. Talk about a mind-blowingly awesome comment. You know, I made, uh, it was great discussion last episode about, you know, uh, 
what we think of the guitar that we own and what it really says about us and, and this notion of not being worthy of a certain guitar. And I think Grant really sums it up in his final sentiment here and just saying that I think what I'm trying to say is that perhaps neither the guitar or the guitarist are worthy in the beginning. And only through time spent playing together do each earn their worth. That really resonated with me and I wanted to share it with all of you guitar geeks uh, because wow, what a cool philosophical take on kind of a, a, a topic that I think is near and dear to all of our guitar geek hearts. And finally, a comment from Jonathan Meyer, and he says this, another great episode, Tony. I loved your take on the whole price versus skill debate. At a recent open mic night I attended, a man was bragging to me about his $4,000 tailor and how he was getting a $9,000 custom built PRS acoustic. Meanwhile, I played my heart and soul out on a Samick Gold Rush D1 I paid a whopping 70 bucks for. I have picked up several high-end guitars that just didn't feel right, and several cheap guitars most I ended up buying that played like butter. They may not have the same amount of quality control as a custom-built guitar, but if it plays good, it is good, no matter the price tag. And I couldn't agree more with his sentiment here. Jonathan really hits the nail on the head, and I've said this a long time. If it sounds good, it is good. And Jonathan kind of tweaked that sentiment into, if it plays good, it is good. Bottom line, we get so tied up sometimes in what the guitar says about us, we forget why we actually chose it in the first place. And again, I think the mantra that Jonathan suggests here is, is pretty solid. If it plays good, it is good. And I'll add, if it sounds good, it is good. And that's to you and no one else. All right, uh, I just wanna thank everybody for their comments. Uh, again, I, I'm so appreciative of the lively discussion that happens, specifically in that Molly Tuttle episode, I asked you for questions that you would ask Molly. Now, I'm still working on that. I'm a couple emails in right now, so I'm hoping that it does happen. Uh, so I'm extremely thankful of the questions that you posed for me to ask Molly, as I have some of my own as well. So uh, thank you for that. And again, just thanks to everyone for, for chiming in and participating in the discussion. It really makes these Acoustic Tuesday shows kind of come to life and bring all of us guitar geeks together. All right, let's hop back into our fight right now. And the next category I have on my list is model offering. Now coming into this category, we've got Martin sitting at three points, Gibson sitting at one point. So model offering, here we go. And this is really how, how well each manufacturer kind of has models that are viable and good in all the various price categories. And what I wanna do right now is start out with Gibson and Epiphone. And I'm including Epiphone because Gibson owns Epiphone and Epiphone just happens to offer those lower priced instruments. So let's start out with some of my favorite guitars in the Gibson Epiphone world. Kicking it off in kind of the starter or beginner guitar category is the Epiphone EJ100. This guitar comes in at a stellar, stellar price tag, like a hundred bucks or $150. And it's a great starter instrument for any beginning guitar geek to get their hands on and really enjoy. Now let's move on to what I think is the bright shining star in this entire lineup, and that is the Epiphone Masterbuilt series. This particular series marries iconic imagery and aesthetics with an actual functional guitar at a really solid price point. Now the picture I've chosen is the Epiphone Masterbuilt Frontier. This guitar was brought to my attention by Phoebe Bridgers. I saw Phoebe Bridgers playing a vintage Epiphone Frontier, and then I went on a complete binge trying to find one. Come to find out that the actual vintage ones cost around anywhere between $4,500 to $6,500. A lot of cash for certain. Now enter the Epiphone Masterbuilt. This guitar is, I believe, all solid wood, and it comes in at a beautiful price point of about $800 uh, upon my last checking. And it has all the iconic imagery, that, that cactus and rope pick guard, and just a overall very cool guitar with great vibe. I've had wonderful experiences with all of the Epiphone Master Boats that I've been able to get my hands on. Now let's enter Gibson Acoustic proper. The standard, the iconic Gibson J45. It screams singer-songwriter, it screams comfort, it screams workhorse, an all solid wood guitar, short scale, solid spruce top, mahogany back and side, slope shoulder design with the iconic Gibson sunburst. I cannot think of a better representation of the work that Gibson Acoustic is doing than the Gibson J45. 
Now let's move close to the custom shop, and that is a Gibson Doves in Flight. Certainly a higher priced instrument, but for good reason. The amount of handwork that goes into this guitar is incredible. From the engraved and inlaid pickguard to the uh, inlaid fretboard, I mean, it's a stunning guitar that looks good and sounds pretty darn good as well. So that's the Gibson Epiphone lineup from beginner to almost to the custom shop. Now I wanna mimic the same thing in the Martin world and see what their model offering looks like. Let's kick things off with Martin's X series, a great guitar at a great price. And this is near and dear to my heart because my first guitar, my first foray into the Martin world was a Martin DXK2, uh, all HPL guitar, a Koa patterned HPL that I actually thought was all solid wood when I first bought it. As a young guitar geek, I didn't really know all the ins and outs of the lineup. But nonetheless, it was a great guitar that served me for a very long period of time. And as I mentioned before, these are great guitars at a great price point. Moving on to the next guitar in the Martin lineup that I think is a standout, that's the Martin 0017L. This guitar also comes in at a great price point and offers a ton of tone and some stunning classy good looks as well. A smaller body instrument, all solid wood, and really just a comfortable and sonic wonder. I can call it a sonic wonder. Uh, it's a great guitar, it sounds awesome, and again, looks fantastic. Now let's move to the Martin Standard line. And I really had trouble with this because I was like, D18, D28, D18, D28. Then I thought back to, what would a young Tony say? Well, young Tony was coveting a Martin HD28, and that's the model I chose. From its stunning, classy good looks, the herringbone purfling, Indian rosewood back and sides, Sitka spruce top, to just its overall kind of chunk of acoustic guitar history that it represents, I thought it was a great way to celebrate Martin's standard line. Now let's go ahead and move closer to the custom shop, not quite custom shop, but almost there, the Martin D45. Wow, this guitar makes me weak in the knees just looking at this picture. You've got a stunning guitar, abalone trim all over the place, hexagon inlays up and down the fretboard made of abalone, and just a beautiful instrument and a great example of what the folks at Martin are capable of doing. I mean, talk about an icon, just a, a stunning guitar. I keep looking at it in the monitor here and it's kind of just taking my breath away. So here we have these two manufacturers, Gibson and Epiphone and Martin. And we're looking at the model offering. Of all the various price ranges, do they deliver? Do they deliver in each price range? And in my opinion, the answer is yes. But who wins the fight? Well, I have to say, I can't name a winner because I think both of these manufacturers do a fantastic job of offering a great guitar in each of the price points. So where does that put the score right now? Well, after this tie, Martin sits at four and Gibson sits at two. Yes, yes, Martin has four points and Gibson has two points. Now, I'm Martin's looking like it's, it's holding on to the lead pretty good, but let's jump into the innovation category. This is a hotly contested category. And I'll say this, Martin has led with probably the most significant innovation in all of acoustic guitar, all of flat top steel string acoustic guitar, and that is the X-Brace. Yes, the X-Brace is, is signature to Martin. They developed it and they really made it what it is today. Now, the, the brevity of this situation is pretty significant because this was a significant change in how we viewed and even manufactured the acoustic guitar. Now to get a little bit of insight on the X-Bracing and its developments, I'm gonna kick it over to Chris Martin where he kind of shares how his, I believe, great, great, great grandfather developed this bracing pattern. Starting to make copies of Spanish guitars because that's what the market was more familiar with that. And he was using the traditional fan bracing, which was great if he used the tie bridge. But he also offered Martin guitars with pin bridges. And the feeling amongst the people that have looked at his early work was he had to move those fans out of the way because he was drilling holes in the top and potentially either drilling through a brace or putting the pin so close to it that it was just awkward. And so he began to move the braces out of the way to accommodate the pin bridge and also the tie bridge, and ultimately settled on and developed Martin proprietary X bracing. The first known version of which in the configuration that we're all familiar with is the Madame de Goni model. 
Okay, so I'm gonna bring up the same exact question I brought up in the Martin versus Taylor episode. If Martin had such a, a revolutionary innovation in so much as it really kind of outlined the acoustic guitar as we know it, shouldn't they just by default win the innovation category? And I'll argue, no. Yes, further innovations were possible because of Martin guitars, but let's just look at Gibson's innovations and how they've kind of continually raised the bar in just the guitar world in general. First up, you've got Orville Gibson, who really started out making mandolins. And fast forward, that was in the 1890s-ish. Fast forward to the 20s with the introduction of Lloyd Lore on the Gibson staff, an acoustic engineer that really created kind of the gold standard when it comes to mandolins. Now you're thinking, Tone, we're not talking about mandolins. Can you stay focused on guitar, please? Can you just focus on guitar? Well, check this out. Lloyd Lohr, as an acoustic engineer uh, with Gibson in the 20s, certainly, as I mentioned, designed the gold standard for the F5 mandolin. But that impacted not only the mandolin family instruments, but also the archtop guitar. And I think that's a very worthy discussion that we need to have because without that innovation, Gibson wouldn't have made further innovations. And one of the main ones that I'll mention is the introduction of the truss rod, which Gibson introduced, I believe in the 20s, if I have my facts right, whereas Martin waited until the 80s. Even though the truss rod uh, uh, development was there, Martin waited to introduce those to their guitars until the 80s. 83, I believe. I'm not 100% sure on that exact date, but I do feel it was in the 80s. So that's a huge innovation that Gibson was on the forefront of. Not to mention what they did in terms of amplifying the guitar, not only in the archtop world, but furthermore in the acoustic electric world. Not to mention some of the really cool pizzazz and aesthetic innovations that they've added, the engraved pick guards, which Martin did as well way back in their early days. But Gibson took it to a different, to a different realm in terms of the engraving kind of matching the time period and some interesting and, and ultimately really cool custom shop innovations. Which again, I'm not saying Martin didn't do, but Gibson kind of brought it to, I think the public on a large scale. So this innovation category, I wrestled with. We got Martin and Gibson fighting, they're boxing, I'm over here wrestling with innovation. What are the results? Well, the results are a tie. I couldn't name a winner in this category because I think both of the companies pushed one another to continue innovating. And if we just look at one company, we would be sadly mistaken some key innovations that I think the competition actually created. So I think the innovation category results in a tie. Meaning the score is now currently Martin five, Gibson three. Yes, Gibson is two points behind Martin. Martin is at five points, Gibson is at three points. And I think we need a little cooling off. We need to, again, we need to send the fighters to their corners. Things are getting a little heated. And at this point in time, while the, the fighters are resting, of course, talking to their coach, Mick, probably, uh, getting them all pumped up for the final two rounds, uh, let's go ahead and, and turn the attention to you. I want you to chime in. How do you feel about the innovation category? How do you feel about the model offering category? Do you have a different perspective? If you do, please leave it in the comments below. If you agree, I'd love to hear from you as well. Now, while you're leaving your comments, I wanna, uh, I wanna lighten the mood. I wanna look at the Acoustic Tuesday family at large uh, because we got some wonderful submissions. First up, this submission comes from Lakeside, California. This comes from Steve Fernandez. And he decided, you know what? It's time to submit my guitar signal. And I'm sure glad he did because number one, Steve has a hell of a beard. Number two, he's got a very fashion forward t-shirt on. Yes, of course, the guitar snow t-shirt. And he shares with us his entire guitar snow. When asked for a description of his guitar snow, he says this, simply, too many to name. That's it. And he does indeed have an entire guitar geek den filled with instruments. And a lot of great instruments are up there. We've got a resonator guitar, plenty of acoustics, icy skulls. And that to me is the signifier of it being absolutely incredible. So thank you so much, Steve, for submitting your guitar signal. And in addition to that guitar signal, I've got some other interesting pictures from our Acoustic Tuesday family. Yes, I've seen some Acoustic Tuesday merchandise out in the world. And I want to share that with you. First up, a picture was submitted from Mike Tedesco, and he says this. 
He says, uh, oh, by the way, Mike is from Sam Samamish, Washington. And he says, no guitar in this one. Out on a walk with my dog, Frankie. Love that name. Wearing my Acoustic Life hoodie and my Nashville Predators hat. Had to throw in the hockey reference. While re-listening to the D18, D28 episode, which is number 133. Well, I want to thank Mike for this picture. But a couple of things. You know, I love the hoodie. But one of the things I think we need to work on, Mike, is, is the hat. I see that it's a Nashville Predators hat. And I have a little bit of a bitter taste in my mouth from the Preds. Uh, a couple years back, the first round of the playoffs, the Blackhawks got swept by Nashville. Not my favorite moment. And to add insult to injury, uh, just earlier this year, 2020, in the 2019-2020 in the season, uh, Pecorine, whom I, I'm a big fan of, actually scored a goalie goal, meaning uh, the puck was dumped in. Pecorine, the goalie, gets the puck, shoots it down the entire length of the ice into the empty net. What team did he do that against? He did that against the Chicago Blackhawks. So while I love the hoodie, Mike, I think we can work on the on the hat a little bit. Um, hopefully you can find a Chicago Blackhawks hat in your future. Uh, by the way, the Nashville Predators farm team is uh, AHL team Chicago Wolves. Little tie in there, kind of cool. Little hockey geeky, sorry about that. And then we got another picture submitted from Chris Davies. He is supporting his Acoustic Tuesday Show t-shirt. It looks fantastic, Chris. And this t-shirt has quite the story. I should say Chris has quite the story with the t-shirt. And this is from Chris Davies. Now, this t-shirt ended up in the United Kingdom, Kingdom, specifically Wales, in the town of, I hope I pronounce this right, Abergavenny? Sounds good to me, and I'm gonna go with it. Chris says this, hi Tony, remember the Mount Rushmore of bluegrass guitarists? Tony Rice, Clarence White, Norman Blake episode? Well, I'm proud to be wearing the Acoustic Tuesday t-shirt that has made its way all the way to Wales. Here's me and my Taylor 210. Thanks for doing the show. Look forward to it every week. Well, I wanna thank Chris for submitting that picture. What a fantastic picture, and I certainly do appreciate it. And if you wanna submit a picture of you wearing an Acoustic Tuesday a piece of memorabilia, a shirt, maybe a coffee mug, or if you wanna be so bold and dare submit your guitar snow, you can do that at AcousticLife.tv, and you can see that submit link in the top menu. Click on it, you can upload a picture, and you can go ahead and describe uh, what you're doing in that picture. You might be walking your dog, supporting the Acoustic Life, uh, the Acoustic Tuesday show. You might, uh, you might be amongst your guitar selection, uh, collection supporting, uh, sporting rather, a, a guitar sonal t-shirt. Uh, either way, submit it at Acoustic Life and um, we'll go ahead and feature that on an upcoming episode of Acoustic Tuesday. Very quickly, before we get back to the fight, I've got two more items. One is the mailbag. Uh, now, I've been getting some questions about this mug here. And this mug says, John Boy Media. And you might be thinking, uh-oh. What happened to the Acoustic Tuesday show? Nothing happened to the Acoustic Tuesday show. John Boy Media, you know, Colorado Kyle, it's Colorado Kyle's fault. Uh, I'm a sports fan, and Colorado Kyle says, hey, have you heard of John Boy? And I said, no, I've never heard of John Boy. So he starts showing me these, these video clips, and John Boy, Jimmy, is it Jimmy is his name? Is that correct? Um, he, he does these reviews, these breakdowns of popular sport clips where he narrates the action. They're funnier than hell. He's got hockey ones, he's got football ones. He's, the majority of them are baseball. And what I love about the breakdowns is that he marries them being funny with actual breakdowns of the sport. Uh, incredibly knowledgeable individual, super funny to listen to. And uh, in support of his channel, we ordered some mugs. Actually, it was a gift from Colorado Kyle to myself. He got one for me, he got one for himself. Then they noticed that we were sporting these mugs on the show. And then they reached out with this mug. They sent this as a gift, and it's the Talkin' Folk podcast. They said, hey, yeah, we do sports, but we also do a music podcast. It's called Talkin' Folk, where they kind of do a breakdown of, well, popular songs and things that they're listening to. Now, I don't have enough episodes under my belt to share a full review yet, but I wanted to share it with all of you guitar geeks and music geeks that uh, this podcast is available, and from my initial listenings, I am enjoying it. Uh, I want to... Um, say thank you publicly to the folks at John Boy, Jimmy, and the folks at the Talk and Folk podcast for uh, uh, just being nice human beings. And uh, speaking of being nice human beings, I'm going to kick things over to Scott H. Scott H. submitted a guitar gratitude, and he is in a location, well, that I want to be right now. It's rainy, almost snowing in Bozeman right now. And yes, yes, we're filming this in June, uh, and Scott is in a much different location. So take it away, Scott. Hey guys, right now, I'm really grateful to you, Tony, 
you're the only one I got so far. Uh, stuck here on the farm. Lucky it's in uh, the sun on an island in the Pacific, but I'm plowing through the your monthly course in record time. I know it goes against all your your uh, suggestions to play it slow, but I got nothing else to do. So I appreciate you. Huge thank you to Scott for submitting his guitar gratitude at guitargratitude.com. And speaking of, if you want to submit something that you're grateful about, that the guitar has brought into your life, just head on over to guitargratitude.com. It takes 60 seconds or less. And once you submit that video, I'll feature it on a future episode of Acoustic Tuesday. Not only does it feel good to celebrate something that you're grateful about, that the guitar has brought into your life. It also gives you the opportunity to inspire and uplift your fellow guitar geeks. So again, please head to guitargratitude.com to submit yours today. All right, here we are. We're at the final two categories of this mega fight. Coming into these categories, we've got Martin sitting at five points, Gibson sitting at three points. In these last two categories, Gibson has the opportunity to tie it. While they can't win it, they can certainly come back and tie it. Now, these two categories are artist roster and custom shop. Now, to just go ahead and dig right in, let's start with the artist roster. Now, I thought to myself, rather than just show a bunch of pictures of a bunch of different artists playing either a Martin or a Gibson, I thought, you know what, to make more sense of this and to make it easily digestible, let's feature four separate genres of music and to see which guitar manufacturer wins, let's find an iconic guitarist in each genre to see what guitar they chose. So we're gonna start out with the blues genre. And I thought to myself, man, I, got, I like a lot of blues players, but choosing an iconic player was quite simple in this category. So I defer this to Robert Johnson. Now, Robert Johnson in this infamous picture is playing a Gibson L1, meaning Gibson wins the blues genre. Let's move on to the next musical category, and that is bluegrass. And I thought to myself, Tone, how many bluegrass jams have you been to and seen a Gibson guitar? And I thought, you know, I've seen quite a few. Actually, Russ Berenberg plays a Gibson, a uh, Banner J45, which is pretty cool. But nonetheless, all the time at bluegrass jams, I see Martin guitars. So I defer to Tony Rice, and what is he playing? Well, he's playing his iconic 1935 D28 Herringbone, and this means Martin wins the bluegrass category. Yes, indeed, currently we've got Gibson winning the blues category, Martin winning the bluegrass category. It is a tie. Let's move to the country category. And holy cow, did I wrestle with this one. Because I thought, man, there's a lot of country artists that have played Martins. you got Ernest Tubb, Jimmy Rogers, amongst many, many others. And then I thought to myself, well, you got a lot of country artists that play Gibsons as well. But I thought to myself, who's an iconic country artist? Well, Johnny Cash is an iconic country artist. And lo and behold, what is he playing? His signature, Martin D35, all black, signifying the man in black. So you'd think to yourself, yeah, Martin wins the country category. Wait, pump the brakes. Okay, pop, slam on those brakes. Because I thought to myself, Johnny Cash played a Gibson too. So who wins the country category? Well, I have to draw it as a tie because I think both Martin and Gibson have been prevalent in the country genre. And I think too many iconic players have played either a Martin or a Gibson or in Johnny Cash's case, both. So that's a tie. So after these three categories, we're still sitting at a tie. Gibson won blues, Martin won bluegrass. They both won country. So we're gonna now defer to rock and roll. Now I think, I think right now you're probably saying, I thought you had to pump the brakes before tone. Now you have to slam on the brakes. What the hell does acoustic guitar have to do with rock and roll? Well, plain and simple, I'm about to make a bold statement. Everybody in the world loves the acoustic guitar. Whether, you, whether you're a rock and roller or not. Now, I think when you think of rock and roll, commonly Gibson Les Pauls, Gibson SGs come to mind, but no, what, rock and rollers have a sensitive side too, and when they wanna share that sensitive side, they of course defer to the acoustic guitar. But what brand of acoustic guitar do they defer to? So I think to myself, I need to find an iconic band, rock and roll band, with an iconic rock and roll guitar player to determine the winner of this category. So look no further than the Rolling Stones. Look no further than Keith Richards playing the iconic Gibson Hummingbird. 
So the rock and roll category, yes, Gibson takes that one for sure. So after these four categories, Gibson wins the artist roster category. Yes, indeed. The score is now Martin sitting at five points, Gibson sitting at four points because Gibson has won the artist roster category, which leaves one final category. One final category to see if these guitar manufacturers come out neck and neck or to see if Martin is the runaway winner. Because again, let me remind you, the current score is Martin five points, Gibson four points, heading into the custom shop category. Now, for the custom shop category, I've been very lucky to visit both the Martin Custom Shop and the Gibson Custom Shop. And I wanna give you a behind the scenes look at each custom shop. Now, my experience at both was awesome and of course, inspiring as, you, as a guitar geek, you can imagine. But just to make sure we're on the same page, I wanna go ahead and visit Martin's Custom Shop. I found this wonderful video featuring some of the very people that I met when I was there. Emily and Dan are the two that come off the top of my head. So let's go ahead and head over to Nazareth, Pennsylvania and visit the Martin Custom Shop. We are in what we call the acclimating room or the wood room. This is where uh, probably one of the greatest collections of species of wood on the planet exists. So I've been here for 25 years, and right now I am the exotic wood specialist for the custom shop. Before the custom shop existed, a custom was just your initials on the fingerboard or a label, or it really wasn't as custom as they are now. And throughout the last couple years, we've tricked out just about every standard model that we have. My name is Emily and I've been here for 10 years and right now I'm working in the custom shop as sort of the middleman, middle lady in between dealers and the floor. Um, I help them get their dream guitars built. I've worked in basically every job in the factory so if somebody has a question about a certain part on the guitar, a certain process, I can give them kind of the background or the different options. We're a bunch of guitar nerds so we take into account all the detail. Yes, the Martin Custom Shop is amazing. It's like a guitar geek candy store. It's unreal. I mean, from, from the wood selection to the appointments to even down to the nitty gritty, you can actually choose the orientation of the X bracing, forward shifted, rear shifted, standard placement, even things as minute as the thickness of the top. Uh, again, to subtle degrees, you can, you can change that. So I thought to myself, okay, calm down because Gibson has a custom shop too, a very capable custom shop. Again, one that I had a chance to tour. And this was when Ren Ferguson was still at Gibson. To the best of my knowledge, I wanna say he was still there. He might've been maybe on his final year there. Nonetheless, I've had a chance and an experience at the Gibson Custom Shop as well. So we should now look at what Gibson is currently up to in their custom shop, see the products that they're making so we can make a fair judgment call in this category. Hi, this is Cesar with Gibson Guitars and I am in Bozeman, Montana, the home of the recently launched Acoustic Custom Shop. The Acoustic Custom Shop has two collections, the Historic Collection and the Modern Collection. With the Historic Collection, we go back to each one of the years that made our guitars famous. These historic guitars have shaped sound across genres of music, across generations, and we wanted to bring those guitars back. Within the Historic Collection, we bring in historically accurate specifications and dimensions. For example, in the historic collection, we have the 1942 Banner Southern Jumbo, which I have here to my right. That's a guitar that's built exactly like we built it in 1942, with the same materials, same dimensions. All of our custom shop historic collection have thermally aged tops, which is a process that we use to recreate the way the guitar has aged over time and bring that vintage sound out of the instrument. They all have this VOS nitro finish that brings that patina and wear look to the instruments for a more vintage look, and they all come with period correct cases. So the historic collection is a way for us to pay tribute to each one of the years that made our acoustic guitars famous. Okay, first up, small world, random guitar geek moment. As I'm watching that here on the monitor in the studio, I'm like, why does that place look familiar? That's actually here in Bozeman. I played plenty of wedding gigs at that very barn. Random, I know, but kind of a cool thing that 
just sank in as I was watching that for like the fourth time. Anyways, let's talk about the Gibson Custom Shop. The Gibson Custom Shop, in my opinion, right now, this very day in 2020, is doing some of the best work I think they've ever done. And I say that because they're straddling this line between this modern collection and the historic collection. And for the first time, I think, they are celebrating the history that we've all, as guitar geeks, wanted them to celebrate. It's so cool to see, and I, I, I get excited looking at those guitars. Not to mention the modern collection where it just really, again, flexes the muscles of the custom shop. So who wins in this category? Again, I think both custom shops are extremely capable. I even go back to when Ren Ferguson was there at the Gibson Custom Shop. They did the series of Gibson L7s, uh, arch top acoustic guitars that were heavily carved. I mean, dragons and like family crests in them and like carved neck heels and everything. So, I mean, in terms of capability, both custom shops are incredible. But I have to say this, there's, there's two factors that really weigh in on the result of this category. And I'm, I'm debating on whether I should just announce the winner right now or not. I, I'm gonna wait. First and foremost, I have to say, the availability of woods in the Martin Custom Shop is stunning. I mean, we're talking some of the most beautiful tone woods available from master grade to, I'll say standard grade, but wow, when you look at them, you're like, how is that considered standard? Uh, so in terms of options, I think Martin wins out big time. Uh, again, from tone wood options to appointments to even bracing orientation, Martin's custom shop is the real deal. Secondly, I think that Gibson their custom shop is extremely capable, but it's kind of been this on again, off again thing. And whatever the reason is, that's fine, but some years they have a custom shop, other years they just stick to standard models, and then the next year they do the custom shop again. And I think that has kind of definitely skewed my perspective in this category. So that being the case, I declare Martin the winner of the custom shop category. And in turn, Martin then becomes the winner of our fight of Martin versus Gibson. The final point totals are this. Martin at six points, Gibson at four points. Yes, Martin is indeed the winner from my experience. Does that mean one is better than the other? Certainly not. Both of these guitar companies are extremely capable and produce some very fine instruments. But again, given these seven categories, I do have to declare a winner and that is Martin. Now in the comments, do you agree with me? Do you not agree with me? I wanna hear from you either way. Let me know in the comments below. Yes, I want you to weigh in because you know what? It's important that we open up the discussion here on Acoustic Tuesday and I wanna do that. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Was this dead on? Do you think Martin is the deserved winner or do you think Gibson needed a little bit more of a play in the matter? Uh, let me know. And of course, if you wanna cast your vote, you can just do something as simple as Martin or Gibson. And of course, on a future episode of Acoustic Tuesday, I'll weigh in and uh, share what you all came up with. All right, thus concludes the battle royale of Martin versus Gibson. Martin being the winner. Uh, and I think this was a fun journey to look at both of these companies and really celebrate each of these companies. But since this celebration is now over, I think it's, I think it's due time for us to take a sneak peek into next week. Yes, I'll bust out the crystal ball and look in and, and find ourselves, find myself answering a question that you ask quite often. Yes, next week on Acoustic Tuesday, you and I, we're gonna open up some guitar cases together. You've asked about my guitar snow time and time and time again, and I broke, you, you, you broke me. We're gonna go through my guitar snow guitar by guitar. I'm gonna share with you the stories behind the guitars. You're gonna hear the guitars, and you're gonna find out why they made it into my collection. That's all happening next week on Acoustic Tuesday. I cannot wait for you to join me then. And remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time here on YouTube. And of course, for your Acoustic Tuesday fix in between Tuesdays, please visit AcousticLife.tv, where you can do a deep dive on anything I've ever featured on the Acoustic Tuesday show. Thank you so much for being a guitar geek. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. I just cannot thank you enough. I really appreciate you. And remember, until next week, Guitar Geeks Unite. Cheers, and I'll see you then.